my plan today was to uh, really not even loop back. I thought I would just move forward at this point with uh, with the lens cap. Okay, that works for me. Okay, any questions you might have to begin with as we get started? Uh, not that I can think of, but I'll let you know. Okay, yeah, well, please don't hesitate to interrupt me because, you know, even if I'm talking, all you got to do is say, hey, JD, I got a question. Interrupt, okay? It's encouraged. So, you got it. Um, I will just say for, for the sake of the workshop, just a reminder that I'm using the Planchard Flashlight Project Live Binders. You're welcome. You can go to that uh, directly or you can just click into it to make it uh, larger. All the parts are, are located here. Each one of these is a link directly to the information and the tutorial for it. And in addition, um, the plan at this point as we get started is that each one of these parts has a video that's associated with it. It's not my video, it's Elise Moss's video, but it's, uh, it's very good. So if you wanna just go in, target your time on any particular part, um, please you know, feel free to grab the video that is located here in these binder tabs. So <clears throat> my plan and my want today is to work on uh, specifically the lens cap. Let's go into this real quick and from the procedure standpoint. <clears throat> so what we're gonna be um, working on at this point is kind of a, a combination of a few different things that we're gonna be working on in this next kind of category of parts. So the category of parts is gonna include our four basic feature uh, builds. And our four basic feature builds include extrudes, revolves, sweeps, and then uh, lofts. And I don't know if we'll get, yeah, we might get that far today. If we don't get that far today, we will definitely get that far when we work on the housing next week. So um, the last time we were together, we did create an O-ring. And the idea is that we wanna bring the lens, the bulb, the O-ring and the lens cap together to formulate this subassembly of parts that if you kind of think about flashlight and flashlight design, well, you know, maybe, maybe there's lots of different ways that I can use those four parts in combination to formulate different flashlight configurations as we go forward. So that's gonna be a word you're gonna hear me uh, speak to a little bit more is this idea of configurations. And what I'm setting up for and kind of moving and inching our way towards is this idea that once we have all the parts made, we wanna combine those parts together in something called assemblies. All right, so our work ahead is to take this basic cylindrical feature and we're going to create a taper to it. So in other words, it's gonna be a draft angle to it. It's gonna have a feature set that's going to have a relief um, and a thread. And it's going to have a way that it will eventually mate together with the housing as we come together. Now, unfortunately with the pandemic, I can't actually show you um, the two 3D printed flashlights that we have in our lab uh, that are true representations of what we made in this Planchard flashlight project. And the threads actually work. They engage together, they actually come together and work. So um, to get through this lens cap is probably gonna take uh, pretty much our entire time today. Uh, and then next time we're together, we'll talk about the switch and the housing. So the next time we're together, just as a reminder, uh, will be um, next Tuesday. So let's see, 16, 19, 20. So that'll be the 20th of October. And my plan is to, uh, typically I will start it at 11 o'clock uh, local time. So, all right. So as we get started, we're going to, um, open SOLIDWORKS, we're gonna get into our templates and we're gonna start with that template. We're gonna save as initially as lens cap and then we're gonna give it a description of lens cap for six volt flashlight going forward. Okay, so I'm gonna click on new. I've already got SOLIDWORKS open. Here's my ANSI IPS template. 
If you don't recall how to do that, go back, take a look at the videos for that. Click OK. And remember that all a template does is allows us to um, save some time because we don't have to do a lot of setup stuff as we go forward. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, SolidWorks is up and my template, my units are set correctly and my, uh, my uh, drafting settings in the form of my drafting standard are set up correctly. All right, first things first, save early, save often, as I say. So we're going to save as, and in this case, we're gonna come right to our name, which is going to be LensCap, L-E-N-S, C-A-P, so that's different than the lens we've already created. And then in the description, we're gonna put lens cap for six volt flashlight, okay? And we're gonna save. Okay, a um, couple of things we learned from uh, the last workshop that I wanna make sure we remind ourselves of. I have not updated my template, but you're welcome to do so. But I'm gonna go into the settings. And now what I wanna make sure that I go to in the document properties is in this area of annotations. So I'm gonna click in um, annotations. Um, and you can see here that all my different symbols are, are available to me, my note symbols and so on. I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be good with that. And then I'm gonna go to dimensions. And the, the notation I wanna make here, now annotations I'm gonna come back to, I'm kind of giving you a sneak preview, but in dimensions, I definitely want to check the dual dimension display box. So what's going to happen is that my primary dimensions are gonna be done and available to me in imperial units, meaning inch measure, it's decimal inch to the nearest thousandth of an inch. And then my secondary measurement is going to be in millimeters to the nearest hundredth of a millimeter, okay? So I've got that, now my dual dimensions are set. That's gonna help me when I, when I actually go to make drawings of these parts in the next couple of weeks. I'm gonna click okay. All right, I'm gonna go back to the tutorial now because I'm at, at that point. Yep, and the tutorial is located here. And we're going to start with the front plane and we're gonna start a sketch on the front plane at the origin. So the center of the circle will be at the origin. The center of the circle will have then a smart dimension of a diameter of 4.9 inches. And by the way, since we're here, I wanna make sure that um, some of the symbology here makes sense to you from a uh, engineering graphics perspective. So we have this circle with a forward facing, forward meaning it's leaning to the right, circle with a line through it. It's kind of pointing at one o'clock. That is a diametrical symbol that basically says what follows after this symbol is to be taken as a diameter dimension. If you do not see that, but the arrow is pointing to some type of curvature or a line, a, and, and in this case, not a line, not a circle, but an arc, less than 360 degrees of circle, that's presumed to be a radial dimension and is often prefixed with an R, or it can be suffixed with an, a capital R as well. So I just wanna make sure you know that, kind of look for it to know what type it is. So we're going to move towards making this circle, then we're gonna extrude it, and we're going to extrude it with a five degree draft angle. Now, one thing to keep in mind that we're doing, that we are going to, and I'm gonna talk about this because as we make this in the front plane, so I'm gonna start my first sketch. I'm gonna right click, front plane, start a new sketch. That brings up my origin. All I need to do now is click on my circle with center. I click on the origin and I drag my 
dimension out. Now you'll notice that initially when I'm dragging it out away from the center, it even gives me an R equals and a number, okay? That is in reference to the fact that from the center to the current location of where the pencil is, is considered a radial dimension, but it is 360 degrees in circle, which means it will be characterized as a diameter dimension when I give it a smart dimension. So I'm gonna click on it, doesn't matter where, just gonna click on it here. Um, one thing, I, I like it because it's a convenience to me, but some people um, don't like the shaded contours, meaning the fully enclosed sketch gives me a, this kind of purplish color in the center. I can turn this off and have just the sketch. So if I prefer to see it that way, then you know all I need to do is select that on or off. I'm gonna leave mine on, but now I'm gonna stay in the sketch and I'm going to move my cursor up to smart dimension. You can see that this changes the color of the circle. Now I have more of a bright blue and I'm gonna click on the dimension and or the circumference of the circle, which then ultimately will add a leader and it'll add that dual dimension. And I'm going to click again. And as I do, it does bring up the dimension itself, which I am going to change to 4.9. I'm going to try to change to 4.9, here we go. There we go, 4.9. But a couple of different things I want to show you right now. First of all, because it is 360 degrees of circle, you can see that it shows that D1. So that's telling me it is, in fact, in a diametrical position. The second is right down here in this box that says units. Now, you notice that it says units in the form of, oh, I don't know, things like angstrom, centimeters, feet, inches, meters, um, all of the different units of measures that it could be. That's a hint that, let's say I know on a particular part and I'm given a reference dimension that is in millimeters. I can enter the information in millimeters and give it that unit of measure locally without having to go back to my document settings to change the actual dimension, uh, excuse me, the dimension uh, unit of measure to reflect millimeters. Does that make sense? I just want to make sure that you can do that in what we call on the fly. So I'm going to accept 4.9 and check the box. Now, sometimes, and you kind of saw it there for a brief second, you saw the diameter change in the sketch, but the actual purple part of the shaded sketch contours was a little slow in picking it up. Sometimes so slow, in fact, that we end up with this stoplight right next to our part name or next to a particular feature in the feature tree. So you see here in sketch one, I have a stoplight. This is a signal to me that is telling me SolidWorks has not synchronized the mathematical sketch setting of 4.9 with the video setting of sketch of 4.9. So in other words, they're out of sync. The stoplight allows us to synchronize. So if I click on the stoplight here, which is called rebuild, and you notice it has a control plus a B key, or if I exit the sketch by clicking over here in the upper left, in the upper right, and if I click rebuild, I will exit the sketch. So now my synchronization problem is gone, but my synchronization problem results in me being exited from the sketch. It's no longer active. So what I really wanna do now is I want to come back to sketch one, right click and edit the sketch. Now you see a couple of different things. One, I have a fully defined black sketch line around the circumference of the circle. I have a relation to the center of the circle at the origin, which is giving me this full definition. This circle knows where it is in 3D space. 
What's important now, and I'm gonna use my left arrow key, and I'm gonna change the position of this a little bit so that we can focus our attention down here in the lower left. So uh, Levi, I'm hoping that you can see that in the lower left, I have this kind of trident uh, view. I have a Y pointing north, I have an X pointing at about four o'clock, and I have a Z pointing at eight o'clock. Yeah, I can see it. Okay, so that is giving me an idea that number one, in the front plane, as I'm making this first sketch, it's going to be at the origin of the X and Y axes, meaning the intersection of that is forming a plane. So that front plane is X, Y oriented. What's important next is to note that the orientation of Z either is coming out of the screen at me or going away from me into the screen. And let me show you what I mean. This is time for us to make a feature. And that feature is gonna be an extrude. And I want you to notice that by definition, our our work will be taken in a, to make this feature in a positive direction along the axis, okay? Let me go back and go, it's 1.725 in thickness. And I'm gonna change that here in the D1 box, 1.725, okay? And if I check that, you can see it's popping out of the screen in the positive Z direction. I can change that direction because everything in SOLIDWORKS to our work is related to either a positive or a negative move. So if I click minus 1.75 in depth, we should see this change to the opposing direction. And it says, oh, well, you have to enter a number greater than, greater than a negative number, right? So greater than essentially zero. Well. It didn't work there, but let me show you where it does work. That's in this thing called reverse direction. So this is a, this is a compensator for the realization that SOLIDWORKS doesn't allow us to work in negative numbers along a number line. In other words, everything's still a positive move, but I want it to now go in the opposite direction. I want the Z axis to go into the, into the screen, not away. You can see what I just did here. That's super important as we start to orient these parts. And one thing that we're gonna have to realize is that we want this lens cap to move, or in, in this case, build this initial feature in the positive Z direction. So I'm not gonna change that direction with the blind button or the reverse direction button. I'm gonna change this not at all, because I want it to go in the positive Z direction. I do want to add a five degree taper or a draft angle, okay? And in this case, you notice that I can even, I can change on the fly. I could go to radians if I wanted to, but I'm gonna leave it at degrees, five degrees, and I'm gonna now have a nice tapered 4.9 inch in diameter by 1.725 deep extrude cylinder, that's, that's all I've got up to this point. And I'm gonna verify, because what I wanna do now is hit my space bar, and I wanna orient to my right side view. I don't even need to move it, I don't need to click it, because now if you notice, my orientation is mimicked in a small window of opportunity right here. Now, up to this point, I haven't even shown you that there is a, there is a way for us to split the screen. Um, and I can work in all three views at the same time. So if I click on four view, I now have a top view, a front view, and a right side view, along with a, in this case, a trimetric view, which I can change. Whatever window I click in is my live window, and I know this because my heads up display is given to me. Okay, so I have a top, a front, and a right side view. Now, in old timey, 
3D, not really 3D times. In other words, we were using isometric and trimetric views to really be reflective of our time uh, and orientation. We would put this into a view. And in this case, I'm gonna use that isometric view. And change it a little bit. To composite, that's another word that we're gonna learn here. So we're gonna composite the three views together to suppose pictorially what this is going to look like in, in three-dimensional views, but it's not. It's a composite of three two-dimensional views coming together to formulate this isometric view. The world of 3D really now relates that to, I'm gonna use my center mouse button and orbit, and you can see that I am able to really look at this part on the back side, on the front side, on the top side, on the bottom, to the right, and to the left. So this is what characterizes true 3D from a composite of three views coming together to formulate this isometric view. Now, if I don't wanna keep those four views, that's not a problem at all, because I can come back in, and in my views, I can either by using the mouse and the uh, arrow key at this point and change it, or I can go to the space bar, it takes me to the same place, and I can go back to a single view. Okay. All right. So um, I do want to, before I get any, by any further, is I want to make good practice out of changing the, the name. And I'm going to say that this is base extrude. Okay. Um, I, may be, I may be a little off on that, so I'll come back and check that. Uh, extruded boss base, reverse direction. Oh, look, it says reverse the direction. 153, okay? Wow, that's really important. That's a small, that's a small circumstance. That's going to get me in trouble if I don't have that right, okay? So it says I want it to be blind, reverse direction. 1.725 inches, five degrees. And then I have this draft outward. So boy, there I go making all kinds of assumptions that I had it right. And in fact, I didn't. So let me go back in. And now I'm gonna edit this feature, okay? I can do any editing on this feature that I like to all the way back to the base sketch if I need to. So I have my, dimension, but I can see that my reverse direction is not turned on. Now it is turned on, but let's go to this right side view and you can kind of get an idea this is going to be a problem. This is going to be a problem because the actual taper or the draft angle is going in the wrong direction. So we are going to check this box that says draft outward. And now let's compare and yeah, this looks a lot more like what we're expecting for that draft angle and for our finished product. Big difference, and it's going to make a big difference because we're actually going to utilize a, uh, the front of the housing and a, and a particular place on the lens cap to bring these two parts together in an assembly. So the reason I did it that way, and I, I mean, I knew that I needed to make it different but I didn't because just a heads up for you all, this is where we have to follow the procedure precisely. And if we only look at the pictures, we may be missing some crucial data. So, you know, I didn't say that there wasn't gonna be math. There is some math in this class. And I didn't say there wasn't gonna be any reading because there is. I know a lot of us are visual learners, but what's super important is that we use all aspects of our visual learning in the form of reading, comprehension, viewing, to assure that we've got it right. Okay, base extrude now is correct. Now it's time for me to start working on other aspects of this part. Okay. Uh, it is telling me to, to save at this point. I'll do that when I come back to it. What's really important is that we're gonna now make a new sketch on the front face of this so I'm going to right click on the front face of the sketch plane and that sketch plane is going to be the surface of the front of that lens cap. Then I am going to 
click sketch. I'm going to use the circle tool and sketch at the origin. And it says the smart dimension circumference and the circumference is going to be 3.875 inches in that location. So I, I, I feel pretty good that I've gotten that correct. And let's execute. So I'm gonna save first, just because I haven't done it in a while, good. Then I'm going to click on the face. You notice I have a heads up toolbar here. If I click the left mouse button, I have the same heads up toolbar that will show up if I use the right mouse button. So there's the right mouse button. There's my sketch tool. So available, ready to go, looking good to me. I am gonna hit the space bar though before I do anything else. I'm gonna orient my view to the correct isometric view. There, straightened it up and my origin now is pointing, the Y is pointing straight up at 12 o'clock and the X is pointing three o'clock. And I just feel more comfortable that that's the case. If I would prefer not to make an elliptical circle and I really wanna make a full face circle, I can change my view to that front view. And I should see that darkish gray line uh, on the exterior of the circle, which is telling me that this has a draft angle going away from me. Circle time. At the center of the circle, click, drag my mouse away. Two things have happened at this point. One, I have a coincident relation at the origin for this circle center. The second is now I have a circumference of that circle. I'm gonna click on that circumference and I need to give it a new dimension. And if you make your dimensions with the um, extension lines to the top and to the bottom as it's depicted here, is that okay? The answer is yes. Is it okay if you depict it with a leader line and it only points to the center of the circle? The answer is yes, okay? I wanna make sure you know that, um, that it's okay either way. That's within acceptable limits. Now, I don't remember what size that one needed to be. So let me, 3.875 inches, great. And I'm gonna change now to 3.875 and I'm going to check. Now I have a fully defined sketch. And what we're gonna do now is that just like we did with the battery, we took the top face of that battery and we made it recessed so that the terminals fit on that top face. We're gonna do the same thing here, except we're gonna actually cut out the center of this um, as we go forward. So the next step for us now is to accept that dimension. I feel confident that that's the right dimension. Notice that my, light, uh, my stoplight is on. It's just telling me that I'm out of sync. That's okay. It doesn't mean I have to actually reset it every time. It's just something for me to be aware of. You might want to check that as you're making your part, just to make sure you're not too far away from what your size and, and dimensional space should be versus your, uh, your graphic space are the two very different. I hope that makes sense. Sorry, just checking a message here. Very good. And now I'm going to I'm gonna orient my view. Currently I'm in the front view and I'm going to push my left button, left facing button on my keyboard twice. One, two. If I keep going, three, four, five, six, then what I've done is I've turned it a full 90 degrees. 90 degrees divided by six is 15. So the arithmetic for that tells me that every time I push the right, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, it moves my shape 15 degrees. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. That can be changed. If you'd rather have it move in 10 degree increments, you can do that. That's a setting and you can change that as a system set. I like 15, 15 seems reasonable. I don't run out of finger when I'm trying to, you know, keep pushing the button. So I feel pretty good about that. Okay, 
one, two, so I can see what's about to happen. And what's about to happen when I move to features is that I'm gonna click on extrude cut. And I, I'm, I'm actually gonna move this a little bit more, but you can see right now it's intent on giving me an extruded cut all the way through this first cylindrical feature. Well, I'm gonna check my tutorial, but I know intuitively I'm not cutting that much because it really says I'm only cutting 0.275 inches for the depth. And I need a five degree draft angle. So let's do that. And I'm gonna change the depth. Now the depth you notice is D1, it, it filled it with a familiar number, and the familiar number is 1.725. SolidWorks remembers its previous D1 dimension, unless and unless we give it another dimension, that's the one that's going to use, okay? But I am gonna give it another one because I don't want it to go all the way through the part. 0.275, not 0 0.275, but 0.275, and I'm going to, click on draft and it's going to be a five degree draft. So what's gonna happen is the draft angle for this is kind of in the opposite direction as the draft angle for the lens cap itself. So it's 0.275 deep, five degrees, check the box. Now, I kind of believe in trust but verify. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use my section tool and I'm gonna change my plane to the right plane because that's gonna be easy for me to see. And I'm gonna check the box here so that I can get a sense that yes, these two tapers or draft angles oppose each other. But let me just double check by right clicking and then doing a function called normal two. And the normal two happened to be to the face that I had selected. So that's okay because I can go one, two, three, four, five, six. And now you see that I'm back at that side view. Here is that silhouette edge that I have that represents that taper or draft angle. And then you can kind of see that this one represents, the two would cross each other somewhere out here at some point, but that's okay. That's what I want. So when I'm checking these parts, just so you're aware, I am definitely going to be concerned with whether or not that uh, draft angle on the interior side is going in the right direction. Okay. I'm gonna move so that I can see the part. I'm gonna remove the section view. I'm doing okay so far. I'm gonna save now. And I believe I'm gonna change the name. Yep, this is called front dash cut. Front dash cut. Cut. So I'm changing from cut extrude to front dash cut. Okay. All right. Remember, you can always use your escape key and any selection that you've made that's hanging on it. You can unselect okay, or deselect. Back now. Now, before I do anything else, I'm going to go back to that really cool feature. I call it the avocado tool, and that's the shell feature. So the shell feature is really cool because it allows us to scoop out, you know, think of a baked potato, sorry to make you hungry, but, you know, think of a baked potato and you, you bake that beautiful potato, you cut it in half, and then you scoop out all the interior parts and you're left with the skin. That's basically what we're doing, and we're going to leave it to a particular depth. So we're going to, or a thickness, I should say, we're going to click shell. We're gonna click the front face of the cut as illustrated. So this one here, then we're going to click the left arrow eight times to view the back face. And then we're gonna enter 0 0.150 for the thickness. And if we've done our job right, we should see the result look something like that, okay? Which is removing a lot of material for our work. So front face, Shell tool, change from 0.1, which is our standard thickness, 0.150. Back 
that's the front face. And I will check. Oh, oh, what happened? So let me look at, and you can see that what happened here was I got exactly what I expected, but I didn't get what I expected from the back side, okay? Because this shell tool did exactly what I asked it to do, which is to a thickness of 150 thousandths or 0 0.150, everything was scooped out. And it was scooped out to that thickness on the backside, which unfortunately was not the correct method to complete this part. Okay, so I want to click the front face, press the left arrow, click the back face, then click OK. All right, so now that I've made this shell, can I undo it? And the answer is yes, I can. So I will exit out of my section view, and I will do a Control Z. There we go. Whoops, I went one too far. Can I go forward from this point? Okay, well, I have a go backwards and I have a go forward. So here is an important list of moves in the quick access toolbar that I have made. So what I've done is that I've gone one step too far and I actually removed that extrude cut. You can see that I've done that there. If I edit, can I undo, exit the sketch? Sure, I can. I can. I could even do more than that if I wanted to, but I can't redo it. So that's just kind of a danger to be aware of that sometimes I can hit um, control Z or I can hit the back, uh, the uh, undo button maybe one too many times. And yeah, at this point, we're just gonna have to go back in and say, well, let's do it again. And the do it again is 0.275, does have a draft angle of five degrees, check the box. Now I feel more confident and then uh, I'm on the right space. All right, F key fills out my window. Now it says click the front face. Does it say click dome first? Let's check. Click the shell feature first. Oh, okay. So don't select the face first. Let's select shell. And now this 150, we already uh, put in 150. What's important now is we're in the box. And we're in the box of front face. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Back face. So I have two faces. Now if I shell, I get the result that I'm looking for. So it's actually shelling in two directions. The first direction being from the front face through, and then the back face, it's shelling through. And because the depth of 150 for all around is the same, we get the material removal that we're looking for, but we don't get more than we're expecting and we don't get less. So let me ask you a question. If I didn't click that back face and I left it the way it was, can you think of a way we might be able to cut that opening anyway? I'll let you ponder that for a second. In other words, if this was back face was still filled in, could I cut that out? Yeah, the answer is yes, we could. And we would do that strictly by probably using this back face. We'd right click, we would uh, make a new sketch on that back face. Then we would come back in in our sketch, we would use a convert entities. And then we would make a, an extrude cut through in the negative Z direction that would allow us then cutting through to make a hole in the backside of that that would result in its it's a hole and we're going to make that same draft angle appear so that it's in the same uh, direction. So I'm gonna check my section tool now. 
Uh, and, you know, I'm really liking what I'm seeing. So in this case, I'm going to come together and realize, yeah, that is the view. That is what I'm looking for. We're going to apply some threads to this next. And we're going to apply a relief cut in the backside of this part that's going to help us out. Now, the eventual goal is that the O-ring that we made is going to fit neatly in this location here. So it will nest in that location that when I push the lens cap on and use the thread engagement all the way around, this front of the housing will come together with the lens cap with the O-ring trapped in between and will give me a sealing, S-E-A-L-I-N-G, of those two parts coming together so more water would get in uh, into the battery and power area that would result in a burnout or a failure. Okay. So we've, we've managed to see it. We've managed to see that gap. What they're asking us to do is change the view style. We certainly can do that. I'll use that again, and then followed by my view style for hidden lines removed. And you can see that nest sitting underneath. Here is that face that's engaged by the uh, section tool. Okay. In what we refer to as this hidden lines view, the, the outline, every edge is identified, the coloration has been taken away, and it, and it uses up a lot less um, video memory. So in this case, it's more of a wireframe kind of look, although it's not a wireframe. We can change to a wireframe as we need to in our display style here called wireframe. And there is, that's old timey AutoCAD 3D that you would typically have seen back in the mid to early 1990s. But in our case, yeah. Go ahead. I was just saying it looks confusing, the wire, the wireframe. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. And, you know, that's really, um, back in the day, when that was really all we had, uh, there were a lot of mistakes made because it was confusing. But there was a hidden benefit. And the hidden benefit was it actually pushed the technology to 3D solids modeling faster forward than we would have had staying in 2D. So in other words, we got a taste of it in 3D, but it was only wireframe. We needed to improve hardware and video so that we could actually get to this place where we love the existence of 3D solid modeling today. Yeah, it's a good observation. Okay, so uh, remember when I went one step too far back and I removed? It appears I removed my renaming of my feature as well. So that needs to be renamed front dash cut because if the feature itself goes away, then it won't keep the name of the feature either. I don't know if the shell has a new, no. Okay. So um, what we're gonna do now, and, and this example, is to say that around the circumference of this kind of um, uh, rectangular part with rounded corners is that I can still use a small amount of sketch that is coordinated with a small amount of feature that I can bring together in a thin cut. And so we did this the last time we were together, we did this on the, uh, on the lens part, and then we did it on the uh, further on the back of the bulb as well. Now we're gonna come back and use it again. Uh, so uh, 183 says, uh, click on the right plane. That's my sketch plane. Okay, so what it's asking me to do now, is you can see, I'm gonna change the view to kind of reflect what this um, 
hidden lines uh, feature is uh, hidden lines view is going to give me, which is a little bit more direct access to the silhouette line. So I'm going to click on the right plane. I'm going to start a new sketch. Now notice it did not, it, it started a new sketch for me, but it didn't normal to that view. If I right click on the plane again, I can normal to it. That makes me feel more confident that I'm going to get a true size and representation of that silhouette line. Um, now, instead of using my section tool, because I can't really do anything, the section tool is like an imaginary cut, but it really doesn't exist in the features of the part. I'm going to change my view style to reflect that hidden lines visible. You can see here. So I have the interior. Okay, and, and if I move this around, you can see anything that's dashed is because it's looking through the part. And as it's looking through the part, anything that's behind a face that is visible to me is shown as a hidden line. All right, <clears throat> what I wanna do though is I wanna grab this edge and you can see now the top of this edge is actually pretty easy for me to grab. I can grab onto it, even though it's not really an edge. It's a silhouette edge, so it's it's a helpful tool for me, but only if I use it with wisdom and properly, all right? So, but before I go any further, I'll start a new sketch in that right plane as I have, and I need to click a center line. I've got to add a center line, because as we learned last time, the context of <clears throat> center lines to features or to sketches only apply to the sketch that they're in. So I'm going to make this line for construction. I'm going to make it a midpoint line so that I can get a forward and backwards of that line at the same time. I'll drag it out. I'm going to drag it just a little bit further than the uh, right side of my view, which in this case is actually the back of the part. I'm just going to click. It can be any length uh, that I want it to be. Escape. Now the line shows up as black for this construction line or this dashed line, but notice that the endpoints do not. The endpoints show up as blue. So in this case, it has a relationship with the origin here that's coincident and horizontal, but it has no idea how far away it is unless I give it an explicit dimension. Now, I'm not expecting you to do this. I'm just showing you that sometimes the ends of lines will show up as blue, but the line itself shows up as black. This would be why. So I'm going to change that, make that 2.5. And when I do, now the end grip point of the line has turned black. So now that sketch is fully defined. I'm ready to go. Do I need that 2.5? I do not. I'm just illustrating the point. Center line. Now it's time for me to select this silhouette edge. And when I do that, it's asking me to do something. So I have the edge of a line, and then it says we're going to convert entities. This is a really cool way to approach this, because now this line, which basically is the sight line of how I'm rotating my finger around this, if it were revolved, rotating it around the part. And because it's at an extreme dimension, so in other words, the 4.9 that we created from here to here, that's for real. And the resulting line, because I'm seeing this as a wireframe with hidden lines inside, it means that that extreme top is in fact a silhouette line. So I'm going to select it and I'm going to convert entities. Now you can see I'm still in the same sketch with the center line and now I have another line here that is representing that silhouette edge. Now just so you, you believe me, let me show you what I'm looking at. Okay. And I'm going to go back to that right side view. Okay, so it then says 
grab the left endpoint and drag it. This where a lot of a lot of uh, you know beginner SolidWorks users are like, "Are you serious?" So I can actually grab onto that endpoint, and the answer is absolutely. So I'm going to select it, click and hold my left mouse button, and I'm going to drag it until it gets to right around that spot. Maybe a little bit more than two thirds, but I kind of know where we're headed. So there's that there's that line that is co-linear with that top silhouette edge. And I've made the line shorter for the purposes of now borrowing this geometry so that I can make a new sweep cut that's gonna give me this cool relief on the back of this lens cap. Matter of fact, I'm just going to clear my way because it looks like it's actually going non-responsive. That never happens to anybody but me. So I'm just going to exit this sketch. All right, good. Still underdefined, still not, not exactly the droid that I'm looking for. I'm going to right click and get back into the sketch now. Um, click on Smart Dimension. Click on the line, but this time, what I want to do is I want to, before I move the extension line, what I want to do is to actually place the line into uh, my, my right mouse button. And my right mouse button then aligns this dimension so the true length of the line is revealed. Now I click it, that right mouse button. Now I can click the left mouse button. It will bring up the dialog box and I can change this dimension to 0.250. I'm going to check the box here. Excellent. And as I do that, this is going to formulate the basis of that, that line uh, is going to formulate this thin cut that I'm looking for. So I have the true length of the line now at 0.25. Now I'm going to come in to my features, reference my work, okay? And it, I'm gonna ask for a revolve cut. And when it gives me a warning message, the sketch is currently open, I'm going to answer the question with a no, because I'm not going to use an enclosed sketch to complete this part. I'm gonna click on extrude cut. It's going to use that line, but remember, I'm kind of cheating and using some other geometry with it. So there's my line. Uh, I need to exit this again, sorry. I really think it's a resource issue at this point. All right, let me click on sketch three, edit. Click on features. Then I'm gonna click on extrude cut. Then I will click on the line. But I'm not getting uh, unfortunately, I'm not getting what I expect, which is that line to be selected. So let's go back and look at this. It says, click on the isometric view, click revolve cut. Well, in this case, it's not giving me the error message. So one last time, maybe it's the isometric view, I don't know. I know it's not, but I'm just supposing I'm working all the angles, so to speak. So spacebar, isometric view. I'm gonna zoom in closer because I wanna see my work. I've got a sketch. Now, it's saying, smart dimension line, enter 0.25, but it's not saying get out of the sketch. 
So that's an important point. So I need to go back in, access the sketch by editing, go to features, go to, am I doing an extrude cut or am I doing a revolved cut? See what I'm saying? If I didn't read, I didn't know, and I made that mistake twice, okay? Now, if you were just being nice to me, you didn't want to tell me that I have a problem, don't be nice, okay? I'm just a human. So now I'm going to use the correct feature, which in this case is not going to be a revolved base. It's not going to be extruded base. It's actually going to be a revolved cut. Now I get the error, and the error says, hey, you have an open sketch. Uh, you know, using this feature requires a closed sketch. Do you want to make it a thin feature? Well, I do. And the way I answer the question, do I want to make it a thin feature, is to say no. Now something magical is happening. Is that it borrowed that geometry and my T1 dimension here, this thin featured dimension is set to 0.1 or a 10th of an inch. But I know I'm actually gonna go the opposite direction. You can see that here. I'm going to go in by 0.05 inches. So I'm reversing the direction, putting it into the, the lens cap, and it's 0.050. So into it, change the thickness 0 0.05, around 360 degrees. It's using this center line for my axis of revolution. And, you know, I think if I've done my job right, and I think I have, I'm gonna hit that green check mark and I'm gonna get what I expect. There we go. And now I'm gonna change my display style back, shaded with edges, and I should get that nice. This is called a relief cut, I believe. That cut. And I call it a relief cut. Either one is acceptable. We're going to change this cut revolve thin one to that cut. Okay. So now we're down to making our next feature. Our next feature is going to be a sweep, and it's going to be a sweep where we're going to be making a helix which is really cool by the way. And we're gonna be making a profile so that we can create that thread that we're looking for. Okay, so I haven't saved lately. I better do that because that's gonna be a problem if I don't. And I'm gonna come back to my tutorial. And so this helix is a way for us to create in circular movement, linear motion, okay? So I just happen to have here a big nut and bolt. And I don't know if you can, if, can you see me um, in that window, Levi? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm doing now is I'm turning this big nut on this bolt. And as I rotate in circular motion, I'm getting linear motion. So I get an, a change in location for this nut or for the bolt, if I fix the nut and hold the bolt and, and twist the bolt, right? That through this thread engagement, through this helix, I am going to get that. It's not just a like a Ruffles potato chip. It actually has one continuous motion I'm going to get from one direction in linear fashion through the center of this bolt, through the center of this nut, to the other end, okay? This was first discovered by a dude way back in the day. His name was Archimedes. So I encourage you to look up Archimedes screw. And what you'll notice around our location, particularly here in uh, 
the valley where we have a lot of agriculture is anytime you have grain that needs to move in elevation, you likely have an Archimedes screw in use. And that is, it looks like one big auger. It sits inside of a pipe. As you turn the auger, the material comes from one end, is lifted as it comes through the pipe and it is literally rotated through that Archimedes screw until it gets to the other end of the pipe at a different elevation and I'm literally moving the material from low to high using a circular motion and using this helical approach. Okay. Okay, so a um, couple things we have to uh, take a look at here is to know what we're grabbing and where we're grabbing. So we have some reference geometry to look at here. So it's asking us to zoom in on the back face of the lens cap. And it says, click the narrow back face of the base extrude. Now I'm gonna stop at 208, go back to SolidWorks and tell you what we're looking at. Space bar, we're gonna to go to the back of this part. Okay, space bar again, sorry. Back of this part, there we go. And now I'm gonna zoom in on this narrow back face right here. And if I select it, not the edge, but the face, it's the one that's sitting as far back on the part as possible. It's that really truly back face of the part. So hopefully I'm giving you a good look. Sometimes this is where some confusion starts because this is where we're building our reference geometry called a helix. Okay. Now it says insert reference geometry. And the first thing we're going to do, and here's, here's a really cool thing that you may or may not have known about SolidWorks, and that is that we're not limited to the three planes of a top plane, right plane, or left plane, in other words, a, a left, right plane, and top bottom plane, and a front back plane. We're not limited to three planes. We can put a plane on any face. We can make planes parallel to, we can make planes perpendicular to, we can make planes to an angle of something. And boy, I'll tell you, this is a really important part of our work with SolidWorks. Because what we're gonna do with this reference geometry and making this plane is we're literally going to offset that plane into the part. And then wherever we are at that point, that's where we're going to create using our uh, convert entities, we're going to make a, a basically a circumference around that part at that location. So here's what we're going to do. Back to SolidWorks. The next choice now is we're going to insert reference geometry. You won't find this anywhere else but features. Here's my reference geometry. If I click the down facing arrow, I've got a lot of features that I can create, but the one I want is plain. And I click on plain, and you now see I have a plane that is parallel to the back face of this part, okay? And it's parallel status I'm going to click insert to the ball, the play manager display, 0.45 and flip, okay? So let's just go through that. So I'm making the D1 dimension 0.45 and check the box for flip. Now you can see that this plane is literally intersecting the lens cap. It's inside the lens cap. And what we're hoping to accomplish is right here in this relationship between the plane and its location on the part to make a new sketch. We're gonna make a new circular sketch on that. So I'm gonna double check to make sure it says, we're gonna rename plane one to thread plane, okay? Thread plane, all right, I feel pretty good about that. And that's right here. That's the reference. I'm going to check and accept it. And where it says plane one here, remember we're going to do a properties. 
name and I'm changing it to thread plane. Okay, all I did was copy and paste. And I'm good because my change will result in a name change to thread plane. That's going to be important for us to find it at a later point, a later time. Okay, so there's that thread plane. What we're going to do next is to go to hidden lines removed, save it, and then we're going to make a new sketch on that new plane. So isometric view. There's my thread plane, and it's saying hidden lines removed. Okay. And what I'm after right now is a right click and a sketch. And what we're trying to accomplish now with the convert entities tool is that this intersection between the plane and the inside of this part becomes a reference. Okay. So let me double check. And it says, hidden lines removed, save, thread plane back inside. Click the back inside circular edge. Click the inside back circular edge. What are we talking about? Back inside circular edge. We're talking about back inside circular edge is right here. So now I've selected that back inside circular edge. And now I'm going to do a convert entities. And so now I have, let me turn off the shading. Okay. And I know it's a little confusing to see, but the, the darker black line instead of the thinner black line, but the, the thicker black line is the put that circle on that thread plane that we're gonna to use to establish our location for our helix. Because a helix always requires two things in SOLIDWORKS. The first is a circle, and the second is a direction, okay? So as we go forward here, now I have this new circle on the thread plane. And I'm going to, just for the purposes of getting caught up here, I'm going to exit the sketch. Now you can see the sketch is fully defined, no more negative signs. I can't see the sketch anymore, but if I use the eyeball tool, I can see it now if I hover my mouse over it. Okay. I can see that sketch. All right, so there's my plane. It's visible, ready to go. Let's get back. We've converted those entities and we're going to insert a helix. And what's important for us to look at are what are the settings here that we're gonna follow? Because we're now gonna make this helical path inside this flashlight lens cap. Okay, so it says insert curve helix. That's what I'm going to do next. I am going to go back to reference geometry. No, I'm actually going right next door to helix and spiral. And it says I need something to refer to. Well, in this case, because I exited the sketch, oh, I forgot I need to enable sketch four. And now you can kind of see in a really exaggerated way, there is, in fact, our helix. So the good news is, is that with that circular reference, I'm getting what I'm looking for, except it's not the number of threads that I'm looking for. So always think this way. The Revolutions is 360 degrees of movement. So if I had a, a reference mark, let me just put a reference mark on this bolt, or excuse me, on this nut. Okay. And I'm going to turn this nut 360 degrees. Okay. Whatever amount of movement I get in the linear direction, that is referred to as a pitch. Okay. Didn't make up the word. 
don't know, you know, that's, that's a history thing, but it's the translation of circular motion into linear movement, right? So let's go back and look at our information. So pitch and revolution, constant pitch. The pitch says that for every turn of 360 to five degrees, we're gonna, or 360 degrees, we're gonna make a quarter of an inch of travel, okay? So our pitch is 0.25, and we're gonna make how many revolutions? We're going to make 2.5 revolutions. And we're starting at zero degrees. And what direction are we moving in? Clockwise, okay? And this is gonna be a tapered helix. So we're going to, or excuse me, um, we, are, we are going to create a tapered healing, helix and uncheck the taper outward box. So in other words, it's gonna follow the same taper that we have. So it's tapered, no taper outward, five degrees. So that it's gonna mimic what's happening on the inside of the part. So the, the thread engagement will be consistent. So pitch and revolution, 0.25. Did it say reverse direction? Yes. Check the reverse direction. Okay, that makes sense because I want it to go more into the lens cap to, than to the edge. Two and a half revolutions. Start angle, just confirming, zero degrees. And we're going to make it a five degree, no taper outward, check the box. So now let's look at a section view again. And I am gonna go back to my shaded with edges. And I am going to spacebar, look at my right side view. And if I've done my job right, and I, and I have, I should see that it insets into the, the material of that 150 thickness. But as it does, it's going in the same tapered or same draft angle direction as my outward uh, draft angle right here. In other words, it's following that same parallel path. Okay, now we're gonna rename, because it says we rename Helix Spiral 1 to Thread Path, and we're gonna save. So this is what we're, we're after, we're not after this. Okay, so we want that correct uh, taper to follow the same line along the taper of the front of the lens cap. Okay, and this helix and spiral, this is gonna be renamed to thread path. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is now make the, you got it, thread profile. So in this case, we're going to be making a new shape. Now, what this is really after is for us to make a shape that is going to be um, of a particular size and the way we're gonna use a combination of our relations and our dimensions allows us to control the size of this trapezoid with one dimension change, okay? And it seems a little convoluted. The, the tutorial for this is a little bit convoluted. So I just wanted to warn you up front that that's, you know, that's what we're after here. The use of center lines is just basically to say we're making construction lines first, okay? And what this is asking us to do is find a place away from the rest of the lens cap. So it's asking us now to make this sketch in the top view or the top. We're gonna to make um, 
uh, we're going to select the top plane is what I'm after. Okay. And we'll do this. So there's my top view. Here then becomes my hidden lines removed. So there's my, that, that's what I should be seeing um, from the hidden lines removed perspective and seeing this helix inside. So now I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm gonna, uh, oops, I'm not gonna change. I need to go back to that top view. There we go. And then I wanna pan. So I, all I wanna do is I just wanna move, right? I don't wanna orbit. I don't wanna do that. I just wanna pan. So control key plus the center mouse button gives me what I'm after. Top view, there we go. Control key, center mouse button, moving this off to the left just a little bit, okay? Now, I'm gonna make this sketch and it's going to be a vertical center line followed by a second center line from the midpoint of the left one. I'm gonna make a third center line coincident with the left horizontal endpoint. So I'm making one, two, three, four. Let me do that again, okay? Let me get a little closer here so you can see what I'm talking about. Because this is a little confusing, all right? One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right, because otherwise I don't have four lines. I've got to have four lines. All right, not five, just four. Okay. So the first it says, create a short vertical center line to the upper top area of the thread path feature. Well, that can be anywhere. Vertical center line, second center line, horizontal from the midpoint to the left of the vertical line, third one is coincident with the left horizontal endpoint. Okay, so we're starting here, 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 and here. Here, 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 and here. All right. So new sketch, top plane. center line, because then we're just using it for construction. Vertical, and how do I know it's vertical? Because if I do my job correctly, you'll see that vertical line in a yellow window. That's my relation, my vertical relation, good. Now, escape. Another center line, that's gonna be, I'm gonna move in closer so you can see. The midpoint is shown right here. And that's this little snap relation here. Click, and I'm gonna move it till I get a horizontal relation. I'm gonna make that line about the same length horizontally as the vertical is on the right-hand side. Followed by a third line vertical. Escape, and one last center line, vertical in the south direction, okay? All right, so four lines, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, Four, or one, two, three, four, really doesn't matter. But four lines, and what we're gonna do is that we're gonna do a combination of relations and dimensions to give us a shape that we're gonna make with our model lines that's gonna allow us to change with one dimension the entire size of this trapezoid, but not the shape. All right, so now, 
I'm going to create an equal relation using the right vertical center line and then the two left vertical center lines. We want to make them equal length. Right vertical center line, click. Now I'm going to use my non-dominant, my non-mouse hand, find the control key. Now I'm going to click on line vertical above the horizontal line, line vertical below the horizontal line. I should see lines one, three, and four in the window. Now I want to make them all equal in length to each other. So if I take a tape measure, this line, this line, and this line are all equal in length. So once I've done that, I'm good to go. Except I need to accept it. Very good. So now I'm using that and the relations to formulate a strategy of how this is going to play out. So I'm going to now put a included dimension of top to bottom on the left hand lines from here to here of 0.5 inches. This one, that one. And when I do, something I think should happen to the other line, right? Is it 0.25 or, or 0.5? It's 0.5. Okay. <clears throat> so you can see that the combination of the two vertical lines on the left, same length, and the same length as the vertical line on the right, when I change the adding the dimension here and place those, it changed the length of all three of them. Oh, excuse me. Okay, green check mark. All right. Now it's time for us to make the profile of that trapezoid. I'm double checking everything here. All right, so we're going to sketch the profile. And that profile is going to <clears throat> have one, two, three, four lines. And we are going to make another vertical, or excuse me, another equal relation of the top and bottom trapezoidal lines here. So four model lines, one to two to three to four and back home. Okay, so I've, I've now made the trapezoid and I'll just escape to disengage the pencil, but I'm still in the sketch. And now I need to make an equal relation of that top trapezoidal line. I'm gonna use the control key, select the two together. Uh, oops, I ended up selecting three, so my bad, okay. Now I'm, I'm selected and I don't wanna be selected anymore. I'll just exit the sketch. and edit the sketch. Now you can kind of see the relation of where it, where it sits. And I wanna select that top angled line, control key, bottom angled line. And now I need to make those rela that relation equal with this third one. Okay, so left vertical, top bottom, I need to come together, all three of those lines together. So I've started it, but I got one more line. I was right and I didn't even know it. But what I'm really showing you is, okay, I 
I messed up on that relation. I can, I can discard and I can start over. So there's my sketch. I'll edit my sketch again. And really what I'm after is vertical, select control key, top angle, select again, bottom angle. Now these all will be equal. And check. Now, let's double check. Yes. Now it says I want to add a Pierce relation because I'm going to do this when I go in and move and work my way to the lens cap onto the helix. I'm not there yet. What I need to do is say, okay, control, green check mark, and I've finished. Now, will this uh, sketch be fully defined? The answer is no. And I know that because of that parentheses that exists right there with the negative sign. Okay, so parentheses negative. That's basically telling me I have an underdefined sketch. All right. I will not have a fully defined sketch until I bring the sketch of this profile together with the Pierce relation to the path. So I'm gonna rename this sketch now to thread profile. So now I have a profile and I have a path. And when I have those two, I have the two things that I need to make a sweep. So I'm gonna use the F key to bring everything together. And you notice I, I, for whatever reason, that sketch is there, but I can't see it, okay? Um, I'm going to eyeball, and there's my sketch. So, so when I click on it, at least I can, uh, hopefully, or hover over it, I can see that it's there. There we go. So my, now the next trick is to bring the profile together with the helix so that we get this finished thread configuration. All right, so it says click the left midpoint of the trapezoid. It's asking for us to click and drag the sketch to a position above the top right corner of the lens cap, okay? Well, I need to select that first. Top right corner would put it over here. So I'm going to find my way to another one of our tools called Move Entities. So I'm going to click on the upper left area of the thread profile down to the lower right. And when I do that, everything is selected. All the lines that I made, all of the dimensions, all of the relations. Now I'm going to click on Move. And I'm going to click on that line location. And now I'm going to move my thread profile to the upper right. And now everything moved with it. I'll use the escape key now because I don't need to move it anymore. And <clears throat> so I'm still in this sketch. So I need to click click the left midpoint of the trapezoid, hold the control key down, and then starting click the starting left back edge of the thread path. The left edge of the thread path. So that would be right here. So let me get a little closer. Midpoint followed by the control key. Scroll out. Scroll back in, and I want that location right there. Now you notice the only relation it will give me, but let's make sure we're, we're not messing up here. So that's saying edge one and point four. Well, if I've done my job right, edge one and point four, and the Pierce relation is the only one available to me, click that. Two things happen. One, 
that thread profile jumped from its current location. I didn't ask it to move, it just did. And it became fully defined along the helix because the helix knows where it is relative to the circle we created, relative to the plane we created, relative to the origin of the plane itself. So I've added that Pierce relation. Now it's fully defined, check. And we're going to change the size in the isometric view. So we've got this kind of humongous thread path right now. And how do I how do I change the dimension of something? I'm going to double click the dimension itself. This will bring up that dialog box again. And I'm going to change to 0.125. This is going to make a much smaller profile, more appropriate, really, for what we're doing. And dimension is there. I'm going to, I'm going to now take this thread plane and I'm going to right click on thread plane and I'm going to hide it. I just don't need to see it anymore. Because what I really want to do now is spacebar back to my cool view here. And if, boy, if everything goes the way that I'm hoping it's going to go, <coughs> I'm going to be able to make this sweep with the thread. Uh, I called mine a profile. They call it a section. That's fine. But a thread section and a thread path. And we're going to be able to see that thread path in our finished work. Okay. So. I'm, I'm actually anxious. I want to see what it's going to look like. So I'm actually going to change back to shaded with edges. And now I need, unfortunately, you know, in this case, I need to make a sweep. And, as, and, and when I say unfortunate, I want to make sure that my thread path and my thread profile get in there correctly. So I'm going to make it, oh, wrong, wrong choice, John sweep and you notice it's it says oh well you need a profile and you need a path i'm going to need to use my fly out here to do this so my profile is here and it moved to my path there's my thread path now you can see in yellow it's previewing what i should ultimately be setting in motion is a complete two and a half Revolution, beautiful helix that now represents the thread of this lens cap. And we're going to use this thread profile or this thread um, uh, section. We're actually going to use it again when we come to make the uh, housing part because the housing part is going to turn into um, using that thread section again to create the engagement. Now there's one last thing that I, I always ask you to do. Um, well, two last things. The first one is <clears throat> change that sweep to thread so that it's properly named. And check off of it. Now I'm sitting in kind of a neutral space right now. My helix, my thread path is still um, visible to me. So I'm going to right click on thread path and I'm going to hide it because I just really want to see and admire my work that I've made that helix. But I got one last thing to do, and that is understanding that sometimes with thread engagement, I've got to kind of smooth things over a little bit. So there's one last feature we're going to apply. We're going to make a chamfer. The chamfer is basically to insert a cut at the edge of our thread that is going to be 0.1 inches and it's going to be at 30 degrees. So this is this is a, a chamfer that basically is going to take a little material away from the edge of that thread and keep it from um, having an engagement problem because it's a flat space up to a flat space. So it's kind of 
smoothing things over a little bit. So we're gonna do that right here. I'm gonna click this edge and that's what I'm after. So I'm now making this chamfer and chamfer is not located anywhere here, but it is a companion to fillet. So if you click on the down drop box between fillet, you'll click on chamfer. And we're going to take that edge one into consideration. And we need to make it 30 degrees. And we need to change it from 0.39 or whatever the heck it is to 0.1. Now I've changed and I only need to make it on the in the on the end that's going to engage with the housing thread. So I'm kind of prepping my work for later. And it takes that sharp corner off. Okay. Now, if you're just following along, if you stopped at some point and stopped following now because you made the thread and it's good, that's a ding. So there's some points associated with that. I want to make sure that you know that. I'm going to be looking for that. So that completes our work on this really cool lens cap, all right? Now we've made that and then at the end, uh, I think we can just uh, add the feature name chamfer to it. So there's our chamfer, we can just say uh, thread chamfer instead. Thread chamfer, okay? All right. Big save now, because man, I better make sure I keep all this good work. Now I'm gonna go back to my isometric view. There's my neutral space. There's my beautiful, wonderfully engaged lens cap that's gonna fit nicely with my housing when I come to that. So that's it for today. Any questions that you might have? Um, well, uh, my computer kind of died halfway through the demonstration, so I'll, I'll have to refer oh, back to this one. Oh. But yeah, yeah. Um, I did have a question, though, um, regarding the uh, the switch in the housing. Um, yeah. I see that it's due the 18th. Um, so does that mean they're going to do the tutorial after it's due? Well, I guess I better not do that, huh? I'll, I'll change the date to be reflective of uh, what that needs to be to cover both. Okay, awesome. Yeah, because I can tell you right now the housing... Is the housing due on the same day? Yes. Ah, well, that's a that's my bad. So I will go back and change those dates. Um, both, I think, to the twenty fifth. I think would be reasonable. Okay. Oh yeah, no, we can't do that. So the lens cap, yeah, that's that works fine for the eighteenth. Uh, but the switch and the housing, I will change those right now to the twenty fifth. All right, sounds great. Uh, I think that's my only question. All right, cool. Well, All good right, luck. Appreciate it, John. Good day. All right, have a good one.